The story of Jacob's vow in Genesis chapter 28 is very important for the topic of tithing for several important reasons. Reason number one is that Jacob's vow to tithe takes place like Abraham before Moses, before Sinai, and before the Levitical priesthood was ever established. Jacob's vow to tithe is outside of the Levitical priesthood. This is important because we Christians also live outside of that priesthood. There are people today who say that tithe is something from the Mosaic law and that as Christians, we aren't under that law, but Jacob did not live under that law either. Reason number two why this is important is because Jacob defines the tithe as all that God will give him, as everything you give me. It is not limited only to spoils of war, but from everything everything that God will give him. The third reason is because Jacob defines the tithe over an indefinite period. It is not limited to just one event. The fourth reason why this is important is that the tithe is defined as being given to God. I will surely give a tenth to you, or more literally in Hebrew, tithing I will tithe to you. In giving the tithe, Jacob defines this as a religious act of giving something to God himself. And the fifth reason is because Jacob's vow to tithe takes place in response to the promises and grace of God. His vow to tithe is not a response to becoming rich, nor is it because he won a victory in battle. No, he is responding to the promises and grace of God. Today, when people attack tithing, they usually spend most of their time attacking Abraham and claim that it was only spoils of war, or they speculate that this was only a one-time event, that Abraham was following the customs of those pagan Babylonians or they falsely claim that Melchizedek was a pagan Canaanite priest. And these four points are addressed in other videos. The problem, the problem is that none of these apply to Jacob. The tithing in Jacob's story is defined and described differently. For people who attack tithing, when they come to Jacob's story, they have to change their approach. So in this video, we are going to review this text and consider the evidence that is given or that is not given in support of those claims. By far the most common tactic is to attack Jacob's character or motive. People say that Jacob was afraid or that he was not trusting, that his intentions were not pure, that he was bargaining, manipulative, greedy, and deceitful, and therefore Jacob's vow to tithe should be dismissed. There are, however, several problems with this. The first is that Jacob did fulfill at least two of his three vows. Where is the evidence that he did not fulfill the third? Jacob promised, number one, that the Lord will be my God. Number two, this stone which I have set up shall be God's house. And number three, of all that you give me, I will surely give a tenth. If someone promises to do three things and we have a record of at least two being fulfilled, where is the evidence that he did not fulfill the third? Where is it? When people argue against tithing, it's very common to hear the claim that Jacob never returned his tithe, but the text does not explicitly state that he did or that he did not. If people want to make the emphatic claim that Jacob did not return the tithe, then they need to show evidence for this, but they cannot. It's an argument from silence. It's just speculation. We do, however, have positive evidence that he faithfully fulfilled the remaining vows, so those who make the claim that he did not fulfill the vow of tithing need to explain how how someone who was thus far faithful in keeping his vows did not fulfill them completely. It's also instructive to note that many years later when Jacob returns home, he sends a tremendous gift to Esau. Notice his positive attitude. He urges Esau to take the gift and says, God has dealt graciously with me and because I have what? Because I have enough. But this presents a big problem to those who attack Jacob because he never made a vow to Esau, but he did make a vow to God. How can it be that Jacob, with all of his great wealth, 
would give a tremendous gift to his brother, but would refuse to return the tithe to the God who has done so much for him, especially when we have evidence that he was fulfilling the other vow. As you may recall, Esau had wanted to kill him and God wanted to bless him and God did bless him. Are we supposed to believe that Jacob was willing to give big to Esau, but not to God who has protected and blessed and provided so much for him? His attitude towards God is very positive. He has dealt graciously with me. Jacob prayed, I am not worthy. I am not worthy of the least of all the mercies and of all the truth which thou hast showed unto thy servant. For with my staff I passed over this Jordan, and now I am become two bands. We have positive evidence right here in the scripture that Jacob was very conscious of the fact that all of his wealth was a result of God's blessing, and his attitude was one of deep appreciation. We also know that God himself specifically reminds Jacob of his vow. Jacob, unlike today, did not grow up drinking fluoridated water eating refined sugary cocoa puffs, watching cartoons. His brain, his memory worked very well, and they lived in a culture that transmitted knowledge orally. So not only did Jacob have a very clear memory of his vow, but God himself reminded him the stone that he set up in Bethel was a landmark, a physical reminder of his vow. We have all of this positive evidence from the story of Jacob fully supporting the idea that he would have been faithful in fulfilling his vow. A second way that Jacob is attacked is by claiming that because he was afraid, therefore his vow is not to be taken seriously. After waking up from his dream, he said, surely the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. And he was afraid and said, how awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. A response of fear or dread to the presence of God or even angels is a very natural response. This is not remarkable and in fact is to be expected. Wenham writes, throughout scripture, the encounter with God brings fear. When sinful man meets the holy God, he is overawed and often becomes acutely conscious of his sin and unworthiness to stand in the divine presence. We see this in the story of Isaiah. Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts, the prophet Daniel. So I was left there all alone to see this amazing vision. My strength left me. My face grew deathly pale and I felt very weak. John in Revelation, when I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. When Jacob was afraid, the Hebrew word is Yahweh. When Moses saw the burning bush, he was also Yahweh for he was on holy ground. Dr. Ross writes, people may revere the Lord, the positive, worshipful aspect of the word, but when they comprehend more fully his sovereign majesty, they shrink back in fear. All worshipful acts must begin with and be characterized by reverential fear at the presence of the Lord. Just in the Pentateuch alone, people are told many other times to Yahweh the Lord. They are to fear the Lord. This is a good thing. This is positive. The third way that Jacob is attacked is by making the claim that he was bargaining with God and that this was somehow another attempt by him to deceive. The problem is that to bargain means to attempt to change the term terms in such a way as to, quote, give you something that is better for you, such as a better price or better conditions. This is the definition for bargain. However, you can see for yourself right here that it is God himself who sets the original terms with six promises. I will give this land to your descendants. They will cover the earth like dust. All the families of the earth will be blessed through you. I will keep you, bring you back to this land, and I will not leave you. Jacob responds with four conditions, none of which change any of these six promises. If God will be with me, keep me, give me bread and clothing, and bring me home. Professor Hyman writes, Jacob sets forth four specific conditions, yet it is possible to interpret his vow as actually setting forth only one broad condition, God will be with me, followed by three specific requests. 
keep me in this way, give me bread, and bring me back to my father's house in peace. These three terms together comprise the broad condition that the Lord will be with Jacob on the journey to and back from Haran. God made the initial terms and nowhere did Jacob try to change them or as is noted here, Jacob sought nothing which God had not promised. And Dr. Matthews in his commentary also in agreement writes, Jacob was asking no more than the fulfillment of God's self-imposed obligations delivered in the dream sequence. And Dr. Alan Ross, Jacob's vow was based on the Lord's promises of blessing and protection, and Jacob made his vow on the basis of what God had guaranteed to do. He was thus taking God at his word. And well-known and distinguished biblical scholar Nahum Sarna writes, Jacob's vow cannot be understood as bargaining with God since all that he asks for has what has already been promised. So the claim that Jacob tried to bargain or manipulate God and change the terms is simply not true. And take a moment to appreciate that. One of the most common, if not the most common attack and smear of Jacob's character is to falsely claim that he was trying to bargain and get something better than what God had promised. And that's not even true. Those claims are false. Previously, Jacob had tried to gain the birthright and blessing, but here, although God has given him great promises, he's happy to simply receive the bare necessities of life and return home safely. And that is a positive, and it's very similar to the attitude of the missionary Apostle Paul Paul, if we have food and clothing, with these we will be content. Furthermore, very important to notice is that there is no evidence anywhere that he attempted to deceive God. He may have deceived Isaac, but there is nothing suggesting that he was deceptive towards God. When people accuse Jacob of being a deceiver, they only cite the two episodes of Esau and Isaac, and in the story of getting the birthright, there is no deception. He tells him plainly, sell me your birthright. Now, maybe people don't like or they question his attitude of taking advantage of someone who is hungry, but there is nothing that is deceptive. Jacob did not mumble this under his breath, and we know that Esau heard him and understood him clearly because he literally uses the exact same word in his reply. What good is my birthright to me? However, Esau was more concerned about food, and verse 33, he swore to him and sold his birthright to Jacob. So while people today might not recommend taking advantage of your hungry brother's lack of self-control, there is nothing here that is deceptive. And when the text itself makes a negative comment, it is about Esau. He showed contempt for his rights as the firstborn. Old Testament scholar Gordon Wenham in his commentary writes that this is important because explicit moral commentary is rare in the Bible. It emphasizes, as has already emerged in the dialogue, that Esau has treated with flippancy something of great worth. God had given to and entrusted Esau with something of tremendous worth and value, and he gave it up for what? For a bowl of soup. And the author of Genesis highlights this as absolutely ridiculous. And even in the New Testament, the Bible says that because of this, Esau is a profane person. Some versions describe him as godless. And then when we come to the story of Isaac being deceived, the Bible says that this was not even Jacob's idea, but his mother's. It was Rebekah's plan to deceive, not Jacob. She speaks to him with an imperative to command him. And even after this, Jacob is not persuaded. He objects and she has to urge him to obey. When Rebekah tells Jacob to obey in verses 8 and 13, this is an imperative. This is a command. So while he was hesitant to participate in deceiving his father, there is no evidence anywhere in chapter 28 that he was deceptive towards God. Today, when people go to church, we constantly hear preachers and ministers of all different denominations say that actions speak louder than words, that what we do is the strongest evidence of what we truly believe, that our actions indicate the state of our heart. Notice his response was to one, recognize and acknowledge that God is there. Two, he gets up early in the morning and sets up the stone as a memorial. 
three, he anoints the stone with oil, and number four is significant. He completely renames this city as Bethel, as the house of God. These are positive actions of worship and reverence, and it is in the midst of this solemn moment that Jacob makes the vow. Dr. Jan Folkelman makes a good point. It would here be in conflict with the tone of the narrative if Jacob, in a matter-of-fact and presumptuous manner, stipulated what conditions Yahweh would have to fulfill in order to be his God. For some time, Jacob has been busy responding to God's appearance and promise in a mood of veneration and gratitude, reacting as befits the occasion. Solemnly, he sets up a stone and proclaimed the name of Bethel, and now he is formulating an ending in line with what precedes. Furthermore, there is important textual evidence to consider. The word if in both ancient Hebrew and even modern-day English does not necessarily mean if you do this, then I will do that. For example, Young's literal translates this verse with the meaning of since, and Jacob voweth a vow, saying, Seeing God is with me, and hath kept me in this way which I am going. Warren Wiersbe noted in his commentary, the word if, found in many translations of verse 20, can also be read since. Jacob was not making a bargain with God, he was affirming his faith in God. And Dr. John Phillips also writes, And Jacob voweth a vow, saying, If God will be with me, or better, since God will be with me, he is not using the language of uncertainty, but of assurance. That was Jacob's verbal confession of his inner heart conversion. Up to now, the ruling passion in his heart had been greed. He always had to get. Now he wanted to give. He stood there like an Old Testament Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus was not saved because he gave. He gave because he was saved. The same was true for Jacob. And more commentators, Jacob voweth a vow. His his words are not to be considered as implying doubt, far less as stating the condition or terms on which he would dedicate himself to God. Let if be changed into since, and the language will appear a proper expression of Jacob's faith, and evidence of his having truly embraced the promise. Furthermore, if the word if here is a condition that will not be fulfilled until God fulfills his promises later, then it becomes more difficult because Jacob vows in verse 22 to call the place God's house, but he has already said set up a pillar and named the place Bethel in verse 19 before he even makes the vow. Bethel literally means God's house. Dr. Linsdale also agrees. Jacob here was not expressing doubt as to whether God would keep his promise. He used the particle if in the sense of on the basis of fact that. For example, if God is for us, who can be against us on the basis of fact or since God is for us? Nor was he necessarily making a bargain with God as if he would bribe him to keep his word. When people today try to attack tithing, this narrative of Jacob presents significant problems for them, so they try to smear him and attack Jacob's character. Again, another commentator, according to Hebrew grammar, Jacob is really saying, if the Lord can keep on working with a scoundrel like me, and he can, then I shall do certain things. Jacob did not make a cheap bargain with God. The phrase, then the Lord shall be my God, does not mean that Jacob is making a deal that he will choose the God of Abraham and Isaac if he fulfills all these promises, but should be read consistent with the previous context, since he will protect me and provide for me, and since the Lord shall be my God, then I will do these things. Or as scholar Victor Hamilton noted in his commentary on Genesis, for grammatical and theological reasons, we are inclined to believe that verses 21b should be read as the last clause in the Protasis, and that the apodosis be confined to verse 22. Dr. Leopold, in his exposition of Genesis, says the same thing. Verse 20 and 21 form the protasis, and verse 22, the apodosis. Furthermore, regardless of denomination, we constantly hear theologians and pastors and preachers and evangelists preach and say that we need to claim the promises of God, that basing our prayers on God's word is demonstrating faith. If we base our decisions on God's promises, then we are acting in faith. When these evidences from the text of Genesis 28 are taken into consideration, Jacob is here demonstrating faith by taking God at his word. 
to suggest that divine promises make prayer redundant so that Jacob's vow must come from a different author from the promise misunderstands the nature of petitionary prayer within Scripture. Throughout Scripture, the basis of prayer is divine promises, and Jacob sought nothing which God had not promised, and he could not well err while making the divine promises the rule and measure of his desires. That Jacob's actions and vow are those of faith and worship is further demonstrated by the text here in verse 22, and this stone which I have set up as a pillar shall be God's house, and of all that you give me, I will surely give a tenth to you. Jacob defines the tithe as being given to God. I will surely give a tenth to you, or more literally in the Hebrew, tithing, I will tithe to you. You can see here the preposition with the second person singular suffix. Jacob's language is very clear. The tithe is personally directed to Jehovah, to God himself, as is noted here. Whereas in the vow, God occurs in the third person, Jacob now, at the very last Last moment addresses God in the second person. This transition displays a what? An obvious change of attitude. Furthermore, as you can see here in the Hebrew, the word for tithe is repeated. It is used not just once, but twice. The first appearance here is in the infinitive absolute, which in Hebrew grammar is used before the verb to do what? to strengthen the verbal idea, to emphasize in this way either the certainty or the forcibleness and completeness of an occurrence. In English, such an infinitive is mostly expressed by a corresponding adverb. This is why in most versions you will see the use of the adverb surely. When Jacob promises to give the tithe of everything that God will give him, he specifically addresses God in very personal language and emphasizes with forcibleness, I will surely do this. And it is this evidence which supports the conclusion as father of the nation, Jacob is setting a pattern for all Israel to follow. Real experience of God must always result in heartfelt worship. Here he gave all that he had, the stone and the oil, and promised to give a tenth of all his future income when his affairs improved. To pray for a safe return showed faith, not unbelief. And this dedicating the tithe to God was no more than a further declaration that the Lord was his God, because offering of tithe was a part of worship. And Jacob's promise of a tithe marks an important moment in his transformation, no longer a grasper, but a giver. Furthermore, this same sequence of the word for tithe being repeated doesn't happen only in Genesis, but can also be found in Deuteronomy. You shall truly, you shall certainly tithe all the produce every year. The same construction used by Jacob to strengthen the idea and emphasize certainty and forcibleness is the same language used in Deuteronomy to return the tithe repeatedly. And his brother Esau, the Bible says that Esau was a cunning hunter, a man of the field, while Jacob is described as staying at home with his mother. However, this man who has been comfortable living at home with his mother is now fleeing for his life. He has had to abandon his parents, abandon his family, abandon his homeland, and travel with just a staff over 500 miles or 800 kilometers to some distant land, all the while fearful that his own brother might find him and kill him, that Esau, who has hunted and violently killed so many animals, may now be hunting and ready to violently kill Jacob. The Bible says that Esau hated Jacob, that he was angry and filled with fury. Now, take a moment to imagine yourself in his situation. Imagine if for years that you had seen Esau, your brother, kill so many animals, and now this man is furious and has determined to kill you. If the man who has skinned and ripped the guts out of so many animals is furious and wants to rip your guts out, how would you feel? So, of course, for Jacob, this was a day of distress and trouble. Starting at Beersheba and going towards Haran, Jacob has been traveling for at least two to three days when the sun sets and he finds a place to sleep in this depressing, troubling, distressing situation. Jacob lies down and in the middle of the night, he has an amazing 
amazing dream filled with magnificent visions of earth connected to heaven. He sees that the angels of God are both ascending from the earth and descending from heaven. This earth is not floating aimlessly in the cold darkness of space all alone and lost amidst billions and trillions of different stars and galaxies. No, this planet is directly connected to heaven. This planet is the object of heaven's interest. There is a highway to heaven upon which there is a great traffic of the angels ascending from the earth to heaven and from the heaven to earth. At a time when Jacob is disconnected from everything he has known, disconnected from everyone he has ever loved, he is surprised to learn that there is a very living, very active connection to heaven. Sin had placed an infinite distance between heaven and earth, but here we find the communication of these two reopened and sweet communion established. A ladder is useless unless it reaches both the top and the bottom. This ladder or stairway is so great that it reaches both earth and all the way to heaven. This ladder is not made by man. This is established by God. It is firmly secured, unbreakable, beyond the power of man and all earthly governments. This highway to heaven is so great and so strong that the angels of God descend and ascend upon it and this magnificent connection to heaven is the exact, it's the exact same description that Jesus used to describe himself. You shall see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. In the midst of this great scene, God himself speaks to Jacob. He says, your father, the land on which you lie, I will give to you and your descendants. You shall spread abroad in you and your seed. You, you, you. God speaks directly to Jacob and gives one amazing promise after another. Jacob is the sole focus of these promises. Behold, I am with you and will bring you back. I will not leave you. Having seen such an amazing scene and having received such amazing promises, he awakes with awe and amazement and responds by setting up a pillar, renaming the place as God's house, faithfully acknowledging that he is the recipient of such great grace and promises and makes a vow with certainty or forcibleness that he will surely return the tithe. And notice his language that this place is the house of God. This is the gate of heaven, that the gate of heaven and God's house are in the same place. God's house is the gate of heaven and it is in God's house that Jacob vows with forcibleness, I will surely return the tenth. In the very same breath where he vows to recognize God's house, he vows to return the tenth. You notice that? God's house and the tithe, the tithe and God's house. Several additional points. People who attack Jacob's vow claim that there was no priest and that because there was no priest, Jacob did not fulfill his tithe, but that is again 100% speculation. It's not accurate to say that there was no priest. It is accurate to say that there was no recorded priest. We know for a fact that there was a priest in Abraham's day. So on what basis is there to assume that there was none in Jacob's day? We also know that Moses listened to and obeyed the counsel of his father-in-law, who was also a priest before the Levitical priesthood. If there were priests both before and after Jacob, then it's a very real possibility that there were priests when Jacob was alive. Unlike any other book in the Bible, the book of Genesis covers a vast time period of thousands of years in just 50 chapters. The author of Genesis doesn't give us summaries of all the great events that took place over thousands of years, but gives us a very narrow focus on God's promise to Abraham to bless the nations and the story of how Abraham's descendants ended up in Egypt, that the author of Genesis does not give us every single detail of every priest that ever lived or exactly how Jacob may have returned his tithe is not at all surprising. And the silence certainly does not prove that no priests existed. And take a moment to appreciate how the author of Genesis has to write a book that covers a period of thousands of years 
and yet still, he still feels that it is important to record several stories of tithing of the patriarchs, and this is positive evidence of its importance, and this of course makes sense. There is abundant biblical and extra-biblical evidence that Moses was the author of Genesis. His initial audience had been slaves in Egypt for over 400 years, and giving them this detailed history and narrative would have been crucial for them to understand the significance of their identity as God's people of promise. For these people living among the Levitical priesthood, the history of their ancestors Abraham and Jacob returning tithe would have had tremendous meaning. The reason Jacob's vow to tithe is important today is because it was before the Levitical priesthood. It was not the spoils of war, but everything that God gave him, not limited to the increase of just one event. It was defined as being given to God himself, and his vow to tithe was a response to the promises and grace of God. People today who attack tithing also like to claim that Jacob's tithe was not mandatory, that it was not an obligation, that it was not obedience to any law. But again, this is 100% speculation. To be fair, to be fair, the Bible does not state explicitly either way. Maybe there was a law of tithing that Jacob knew about, and having had this powerful, grace-filled encounter with God, he decided then and there to begin to obey that law. Or, or maybe there was no law of tithing. Again, the narrative does not state either way. The problem, however, is that earlier, God himself does state explicitly that Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. We know for a fact that before the time of Moses, there were commandments and statutes and laws, and that Abraham knew about all of these and kept them. And we know this because God himself said so. Now, let me say this slowly. It is certainly possible that tithing was one of these statutes or laws, and it's also possible that maybe it was not. The problem is that today, when people attack Abraham and Jacob, they claim that there was no law. But this, again, is entirely speculation. How do they know that tithing was not one of these commandments, statutes, and laws? They don't know. There were obviously quite a few, but the author of Genesis didn't feel that it was necessary to explain what all of these were. The problem is that when people today make arguments based upon their own opinion and speculation, then they are not in any position to tell other people that their opinions are wrong. If one's opinion is a source of truth, then everyone's opinion is a source of truth. This is why it's important to stay within the text. Furthermore, on this same question, if you took out a pair of scissors and cut the story of Jacob out of the Bible, there would still be a big problem because in the New Testament, the author of Hebrews makes the claim that Levi paid tithes through Abraham to Melchizedek. Now, if as is claimed that there was no law of tithing during the time of Abraham and Jacob, this would be a serious error in the Bible because the Levites, they received tithe according to the law and commandment. It would be wrong to make the claim that the tithe of the Levites under the law could be given to Melchizedek when, as is claimed today, apparently no such law existed. People today who argue against tithing try to change the nature of the tithes, that it was not by command with Abraham and Jacob, but that it was by command with the Levites. But the author of Hebrews, he makes the completely opposite claim that the Levites, they paid tithe through Abraham. In other words, they say that the tithes of Abraham and the Levites are as different as apples and oranges, but how could the Levites give oranges through Abraham's apples unless, of course, the author of Hebrews is correct and that there is no difference in their nature? This is why if you listen to arguments against tithing, and as I've pointed out many times in other videos, this is why people who argue against tithing try to avoid Hebrews 7, 9 through 10 as much as possible or just completely ignore it because it causes them so much trouble. 
For example, author Russell Kelly, who has tried so hard to come up with valid arguments, he himself admitted to me, quote, I cannot reconcile this no matter how hard I try. Dr. Kelly, like others, has tried for years and years to attack tithing, but his speculations do not fit with the Bible. So like others, he just ignores this important evidence. The Bible does not say some scripture. The Bible does not say certain parts of the scripture. No, it says all scripture is given by inspiration of God. Genesis 14, Genesis 28, Hebrews 7, all scriptures are given by inspiration of God, which means that the author of Hebrews was telling the truth. People today also try to attack Jacob by saying that Jacob didn't return tithe until God gave him something. But this is a non-statement. Of course, you can't return tithe on nothing. As several scholars noted, the very thing that Jacob undertakes to do to pay tithe is in itself defined and only possible through that which God does and gives. Returning tithe on something requires you to actually have something on which to tithe. Jacob has nothing, so of course God will have to provide, and God did provide. That Jacob makes the promise to return to God a tithe of anything he receives in the future is very positive evidence of commitment and positive change in attitude over and over and over, repeatedly throughout the scriptures we are warned of the dangers of greed and covetousness, that if we are not careful, what people seek to possess may end up possessing our hearts and minds. A famous quote attributed to Martin Luther is that there are three conversions, the conversion of the heart, the conversion of the mind, and the conversion of the wallet. And another quote attributed to John Wesley, the last part of a man to be converted is his wallet. And of course, stories like the rich young ruler testify that throughout history, it is often very difficult for people to surrender all or even a portion of their wealth to support God's work. For many people, there is tremendous resistance to surrendering even a portion of their money and possessions for religious purposes. So that of all people, it was Jacob who surrendered where many people resist is very strong evidence for a positive change in his life. When confronted with this example, many people try to attack Jacob by claiming that he only tithed just one time. The evidence in the biblical text that he was faithful to fulfilling his vow is overwhelming. So people today say, well, yes, it's, it's, it's very likely that he did fulfill his vow and returned tithes, but it was only one time. Number one, this is, again, entirely speculation. How do they know Jacob never returned tithe more than once? They don't know. They are just speculating. And number two, Jacob specified in the vow that he would tithe of everything, of all that God would give him. People today who attack tithing claim that Jacob only returned tithe on wealth obtained during the 20 years that he was away from home. But Jacob lived to be 147 years old. What evidence do they provide that he never tithed again after returning home? Nothing. Furthermore, very positive evidence. Notice that the verb to tithe, which is here repeated twice, this is in the verbal stem PL, and it occurs in the same stem a total of seven times in the Old Testament. And guess what? It refers to tithing with regularity and frequency. Tithing that is repeated. You can see for yourself here in Deuteronomy, year by year, and also every third year. Again, in Nehemiah, year by year, the verb used by Jacob in his vow, as we saw earlier, is not only written in the infinitive absolute to emphasize forcibleness and completeness, but it's also in the same verbal form used elsewhere to indicate tithing with regularity and frequency. So again, to repeat, we don't know exactly how or where Jacob returned tithe, nor do we know exactly how many times. What we do know is that the evidence in the text indicates certainty forcibleness, regularity, and frequency. There are also important lessons to learn when we compare this story to ourselves today. For Jacob, the promise that his seed would be a blessing to all the earth was for the future, but for us, we see how this promise has been and continues to be fulfilled. Jacob, he did not know about Moses or the amazing miracles or deliverance from Egypt. Jacob never heard about David and Goliath. He knew nothing of the stories of 
Gideon and Jonah, Jacob never heard about the superpowers given to Samson, nor did Jacob see the glory of Solomon's reign. Jacob never heard about the virgin birth or the ministry of Christ. Jacob never knew about the blind who could see and the deaf who could hear. We, we have heard these stories a thousand times, but Jacob, he knew nothing of this. Jacob never heard about Lazarus being raised from the dead or the amazing story of the Son of God himself defeating death death and escaping from the tomb, but we, we know all of this and much more. We have 10,000 times greater knowledge of God's character and plan and great love demonstrated throughout all of biblical history. And the Bible says, to whom much is given, much is required. If Jacob responded to the grace of God with a commitment to worship and return 10%, then how in the world can we who have so much more ever give less? For Jacob, this was a dream, but for us, this is a reality. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. We literally hold in our hands the written word of God's promises and the historical record of his interaction with his people for thousands of years, demonstrating that he is a very loving and very faithful God. And this whole dream and promise was pointing to Christ, for it was Jesus himself who at the beginning of his ministry said, Truly I tell you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the who? On the Son of Man. Jesus takes the language of Jacob's dream and applies it to himself. He is the ladder. He is the connection between earth and heaven. Jesus did not come to point to some other way to heaven. He is the way. Notice in the dream that there are not two ladders or 50 ladders or 3,000 ladders. No, there is only one ladder, only one connection to heaven. And that connection, that ladder is a person. And that person is Christ and it is his expressed, explicit will that this good news should be preached to all of the world, that all of the earth should be blessed by the seed of Jacob. And this great work needs ministers and evangelists and missionaries. And if 10% was the minimum for giving in the Old Testament, then how can any Christian today who loves Jesus and wants to make him known ever give less? Jacob was the grandson of Abraham and the son of Isaac, but the scriptures say that we are the sons and daughters of God. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us, that we should be called the children of God. Jacob was a fugitive fleeing from his family and homeland, but we are Christians who belong to the church, which the scriptures say is the very body of Christ. And the church does not exist so that we can sit around holding hands. No, the church has a very specific defined task of taking the good news, not just to every country, but to every tribe, every tongue, and distinct people group. Jacob was concerned about the necessity of preserving his physical life, but we see the greater picture with greater clarity of the necessity of seeking eternal life. Jacob was afraid of one man who wanted to kill him, but we today see the greater picture with greater clarity of Satan who goes about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. The hymn, A Mighty Fortress is Our God, describes the situation well. For still our ancient foe doth seek to work us woe. His craft and power are great and armed with cruel hate on earth is not his equal and though this world with devils filled we live in a world where Satan and his demons are constantly working 24 7 day and night to lead people into sin and darkness and eternal death and as Christians who are motivated and compelled by love it is our duty to use the resources that God has given us to advance Christ's kingdom in this world. And if under Moses, the Jews gave a minimum 10%, then how can we give less? If Jacob, if Jacob was moved to return the tithe because he saw some ladder or staircase in a dream, then how should we respond to seeing Christ crucified on the cross? The Coca-Cola company spends on average 
four billion dollars each year to market its drinks to consumers around the world their total gross revenue during these same years before any deductions is average almost 39 billion while their marketing budget is four billion so do the math the coca-cola company spends at least 10 percent they give at least a tithe of all their gross revenue because promoting their product is so important most christians today sadly won't even give half that and this is because coca-cola believes more in promoting sugar water than many christians believe in promoting the gospel of eternal life there is only one ladder there is only one way to be saved there is only one christ we live in a world where people are more zealous to promote soda pop than Christians are to promote salvation, and that's a fact. And it's worse, many Christians today make every possible excuse why they don't have to give a minimum of 10%. Now the folks at Coca-Cola, they think, they plan, they strategize how they can spend more to reach the unreached with their product, but many Christians today, they think and they conjure up every excuse why they don't have to support taking the gospel to the unreached. The comparison of the marketing budget of Coca-Cola and Christians is very disturbing because it is objective evidence revealing that many Christians don't really believe that the gospel is worth sharing or worse, that it is worth sharing, but they just don't want to do it. They know that there is a hell to escape from and a heaven to win, but they don't want to tell you about it. How can this be? How can it be that people who are motivated by earthly riches are willing to spend more than those who seek eternal riches? Anyways, moving on, notice also in the book of Genesis, the story of the Tower of Babel, revealing that man is incapable by his own efforts of reaching God, but the story of Jacob's ladder reveals that God is reaching down to us. Babel and Bethel are opposites that illustrate the two different paths promising salvation, human works versus divine grace. All true religion is based on the humble Bethel model, for by grace you have been saved through faith. All false religion, including legalism and secular humanism, is based on the proud Babylon model. Jacob's ladder is one of the most grace-filled encounters in all of scripture, and this is important because if Jacob's response to grace was worship and commitment to give, then what should our response be? If Jacob responded by committing 10% of everything that God would give him, if Jacob responded this way to a dream, then how how much more should we Christians respond to the reality? If God promised Jacob, I am with you and will not leave you, and Jesus has promised us, I am with you always, even to the end of the age, if the same and greater promises have been given to us, then how in the world can we give less? In summary, the story of Jacob's vow is very important for the topic of tithing because it took place outside of the Levitical priesthood. He tithed of everything that God gave him. It was not limited to just spoils of war. It was not limited to just one event, but all that God would give him, the tithe was defined as being given to God himself, and it was a response to tremendous promises. It was a response to grace. His objective actions following the dream were those of reverence and worship. His response was to state with certainty and forcibleness that he would surely, he would surely return the tenth.